Hello all and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are just gonna get started a, a minute or two later today, but if you would be willing to tell us where you're joining us from as you log in, that would be fabulous. We sincerely appreciate everyone who joins us and it's always so much fun to see where you're joining us from. So please feel free to, to include that in the chat box and I will share those um, comments. Mike Orton from Greeley. Marion is joining us from New York. Um, Kay is here from Longmont. Um, Park City, Utah. Uh, Susan is from joining us from Miami. Thank you all for joining. We are really glad that you're here today. Steve is here from Mesa Valley. Hey, Stephen, thanks for joining us. Stephen has been a presenter of ours twice in the past, so always grateful to him. Thanks for joining. Um, we're just bringing Christine McAllister on today. She is our, our speaker of the day, and we were having a couple of technical difficulties getting her in, but we are so glad that she is here. Um, again, please continue to tell us where you're joining us from. Rhonda and Dennis are neighbors to Mesa Verde Visitor Center. Rhonda, I've spoken with you about your property. It is incredible and you are literally on the line. So thanks so much for joining us. I feel like you probably could have just walked into the park and, and learned a little bit more today, but we're happy that you're here. We, oh, Jim, I'm going to say this wrong. Jim is joining us from Samamashish. Some some momish, some momish, Washington. <laughs> Jim, thanks for being here. We have um, Alita from or Aletta from California. We have people from all over the United States today. So thanks very much for letting us know that you're here. Um, Tammy from Durango. We also appreciate people who are neighbors to the park. So Please feel free to continue to let us know that, that you're here and where you're joining us from. But as I said earlier, we're getting a little bit of a late start today. So I am going to just uh, hand it off to our beautiful host for today's webinar, Monica Buckle. Well, thank you, Shannon. You're always too kind. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. It's wonderful to see the different towns and cities everyone is tuning in from. We are privileged to have Christine McAllister presenting again. Christine is a Mesa Verde National Park archaeologist. Christine will discuss the results of archaeological surveys and testing for the Mesa Verde Top and Cliff Palace Loops roadwork. Christine will explain the surveys conducted ahead of proposed roadwork and how 72 archaeological sites were recorded, which included Basket Maker 3 through to Pueblo One period sites. The Mesa Verde Foundation is the official philanthropic nonprofit partner to Mesa Verde National Park. As a foundation, we secure funding for the park's capital improvements, special projects, and further promote understanding and preservation for ancestral Puebloan culture. We have some exciting news. On Tuesday, April the 26th, Bonhams is hosting a Western art auction that will include three artworks benefiting the Mesa Verde Foundation. The pieces include two sculptures by Steve Kestrel and one painting by Mian Situ. Steve Kestrel has generously donated Little Dipper and Run River Run. Mian Situ has kindly donated Alert at Dusk. These pieces in the auction are lots 86, 87, and 88. You can find more information and view the items using the link in the chat box. Also, on Wednesday, May the 4th, the Mesa Verde Foundation is kicking off its third annual virtual fundraising auction that will run through till May the 14th. While this auction will not have art items of the caliber of those in the Bonhams auction, it will include collectibles, outdoor gear, gift certificates, special experiences, and one of a kind items. Please watch your email for further information as well as the auction link. Now, circling back to our guest speaker, 
Christine has been an archaeologist at Mesa Verde National Park since 1999. She has directed numerous archaeological surveys and documentation projects in the park. She has over 25 years of field experience on both private and public land, including survey, excavation, analysis, and cultural resource management. During her time at Mesa Verde, Christine has conducted site condition assessment, architectural documentation, post-fire assessment, and treatments. She has also worked as a fire archaeologist and resource advisor during wildland fires. Christine holds a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology from Marquette University. Addis additionally, since 2018, she has worked on the North Abydos Excavations Team in Egypt, co-directed by New York University's Institute of Fine Arts and Princeton University. We'll be happy to take questions at the end of the presentation. And now I would like to welcome Christine. Hi, thank you. <laughs> Thanks everybody for joining us. Well, thank you, Christine, for a uh, webinar part two for you. This is wonderful to have you back. It's great to be back. Yeah, thanks for putting these on. They're great. Uh, well, wonderful. Thank you. But before we begin, um, weren't you just in Egypt working on um, an archaeology dig over there? Oh, I was. Yes, I went, got a chance to go back over this year and we were working uh, north of Abydos in a cemetery area, uh, which also has ancient uh, beer production areas. So it was really interesting, and really exciting. Wow, you do such great work. So why don't we just get into it? And that's what we're all here for. So whenever you're ready, you can pull up your slideshow. Okay, sounds good. All right, give me just a second here. Okay, the little chat bar moved on me, so here we go. <laughs> From the beginning. <laughs> All right, and let me minimize this. Beautiful. Okay. All right, here we go. Um, today I'm going to be talking about the results of our archaeological surveys and testing that we did for a big uh, road improvement project that is currently going on in the, the park. Um, they started work on the road last year and it will be continuing um, this year. So, here we go. Some reason it's not advancing. There we go. <laughs> okay, uh, so this map shows our survey locations. Uh, we did these surveys in 2017 and 2018. Um, the Ruins Road loop consists of the Mesa Top loop, which you are seeing in red. And it has a little spur road, the Sun Temple Loop, which is seen in yellow. And then the Cliff Palace Loop, uh, which leads to Cliff Palace and Balcony House, that is shown in blue. So we surveyed the, the Mesa Top Loop and Sun Temple Loop in 2017, and then uh, Cliff Palace Loop in 2018. That was a total of just over eight and a half miles of paved road. Um, those loops also access sites like Square Tower House and the uh, Site, sites that are under shelters on the Mesa Top Loop. Uh, the scope of work for this project was to replace the pavement on all three loop roads and the parking areas, um, to replace uh, failing drainage systems, resurface the pullouts that are alongside of the road and do repairs to the shoulders. Along with that, they were gonna widen the road from nine feet to 10 and a half feet. Um, and also replacing the asphalt sidewalks with colored concrete sidewalks. And finally, um, there was a proposed bike lane along the Mesa Top Loop. And in this picture, you can see just how narrow the road is in spots. This is uh, along Fuchs Canyon, uh, where there's overlooks to the Fuchs Canyon sites, including Oak Tree House. And uh, when there are bikes on this road, it's, it's really uh, narrow in, in spots like this and hard for people to get around. 
So um, <clears throat> our crew consisted of four archaeologists each year, and the survey size was 100 feet uh, along both sides of the, the park's roads. So um, that was all the way around both loops. Um, our, our main goal was to uh, figure out how many cultural resources we had in this project area to record their location and uh, determine impacts from the project and also the feasibility of this proposed bike lane. So in 2017, we surveyed along 4.4 miles approximately of the Mesa Top Loop Road and uh, almost a half mile of that Sun Temple Spur Road. In that area, we had 47 archaeological sites to record. And then in 2018, uh, we surveyed along 4.2 miles, that Cliff Palace Loop Road, and we recorded 24 archaeological sites. But a little bit of background, um, this road system was originally established in the 1920s and early 1930s, uh, but it was based on, it had its origins on old pack trails, wagon roads, um, so there'd been a lot of traffic on the Mesa even prior to the road being officially established. And back then there was no attempt to avoid cultural resources. It was a different era. And, and therefore uh, this road goes right through quite a few sites. There's a high density of sites on this part of Chapin Mesa, especially along the Mesa Top Loop Road. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and the road goes right over or adjacent to quite a few of these. Uh, some previous surveys in the project area. The main one was the Chapin Mesa survey back in the early 1950s. There was also a cadastral survey done in the mid 1980s. And then after our Long Mesa fire, which occurred in 2002, we had a Long Mesa new site inventory project. And uh, this, uh, the recording, of sites uh, was done a few years after the fire. Uh, it took that long to get the project underway. But that was in 2005 and 2006, mainly on this part of Chapin Mesa. Uh, but it was not 100% coverage. So uh, we had a lot of old sites to update. Uh, a little background on the Chapin Mesa survey. That was directed by Al Lancaster, and he had uh, three people assisting him. It started in, uh, I believe, December of 1951. They started on Lower Chapin Mesa and they worked their way northward. Uh, the Mesa tops were surveyed first and then they did the surrounding canyons afterward, which had most of the Alco sites. Um, we don't know a lot about the methodology of the early surveys. Um, we just have their records. The recording consisted of site type, time period, location, which was hand plotted, and a few sentences of a description, but not a lot of uh, information there. And they also did not include overall site dimensions, but they did often give dimensions of like a rubble mound or a kiva. Um, there were very few sketch maps associated uh, with the survey uh, and almost no photographs, but there was usually a shared collection. Um, Oh, and Arthur Roan also worked on, on these sites uh, a, a few years later. He revisited them in 1958 and 1959, and he would sometimes add a sketch. Uh, you can see on this slide an example of what those site survey cards look like. Uh, that was the extent of the information we have about each site, um, and some were even more sparse, uh, sparse than this here. So we had some challenges for updating these records. We wanted to maintain site numbers and, and be able to relocate the sites that were originally recorded and make sure we were in the same spot. But these sites were hand plotted. And since they were only minimally described and there weren't any photographs, it was sometimes difficult to relocate the sites, especially if the site stake was missing, which we encountered quite a few times. Um, we mark these sites in the field with aluminum site stakes today. Back in the 1950s, they used uh, rebar and they had the site number stamped on the end. And so that's what we look for uh, to, to make sure we're in the right place. Uh, another note about Lancaster and his crew, they tended to record an individual structure such as a rubble mound as a site. And often these sites have multiple structures on them 
and they got recorded as, as multiple sites rather than just one larger habitation. So what that does is it inflates the number of sites that we're dealing with and it, it skews our database in terms of what type of site it is. Uh, so, you know, that was one of our jobs was to go in and, and get a more accurate representation of what was there. Another challenge was determining our site boundaries because there was such high site density and these continuous artifact scatters over large areas that um, it was hard to distinguish where one ended and another began and if they were overlapping um, exactly how to deal with that. Uh, so that is, uh, that is what we were facing when we went into the survey. Um, and just another note, these early surveys mainly focused on the, the obvious architecture that you could see well and many subtle features were um, just overlooked. So here's a little bit about our modern site survey methodology. Um, when we're conducting pedestrian survey in the park, we walk linear transects. Um, depending on the area, it could be 10 or 15 meter intervals. These surveys are done at 10 meter intervals. And when we're doing these surveys, we record all prehistoric and historic artifacts and features. That includes historic roads and trails and historic debris that's alongside of the roads or in areas where people used to camp. And there is quite a bit of historic material out there. Uh, we record all sites and isolated finds with modern forms and we map them with GPS units. Um, as we're surveying, we use pin flags to mark everything we're seeing, all the features and artifacts, and that helps us uh, get a visual on what we're dealing with and it helps us um, with the mapping quite a bit. Uh, as far as the artifacts, we record them by artifact class, material type, and quantity. And um, sometimes we just do a sample if we've got a really large site with a lot of artifacts, but we do always record all of the diagnostic artifacts, things that uh, tell us uh, what time period we're in, if we have uh, a good size piece of a, a pot or a bowl or a, a projectile point, things like that. We also take photographs of everything we do, site overviews, features, and selected artifacts. Here is a sample of what the uh, hard copy of our survey form looks like. We also have a digital copy. The whole thing is pretty lengthy because uh, we, we include uh, an artifact inventory sheet and a site narrative. And then there's also some reference pages in there, um, like a list of our Mesa Verde site types and feature types. Here's an example of a modern site map that was done with uh, GPS and we include um, the site stake that I mentioned that marks uh, what site, what the site number is. Also the boundaries, individual features, concentrations of artifacts, and any park infrastructure that is adjacent to or running through the site. Okay. Um, oh, and a few other things we, we record um, would be uh, survey markers that uh, either were put in by the park or the USGS. Um, also trails and things like that. All right, uh, just a note about um, combining previously recorded sites. As I mentioned, uh, a lot of sites that really should have been one large village site or, or something like that were recorded as individual sites. And so uh, when we determined that we had these site stakes really close together and it was obvious that it was uh, one larger habitation, and sometimes it wasn't so obvious, but we would really take some time to uh, do a more intensive survey of the area, figure out, you know, is this a contemporaneous and continuous occupation, and then we would combine those sites into one. Um, there were a few issues with, you know, which site number do we use, do we get a new one? We decided to keep the lowest site number um, unless that site had been previously excavated, because then there's all these records associated with it. There's reports and artifact collections, maps, photographs that are all labeled that way. So then we would keep that number. Uh, but this helps us to update our database and, and get a more accurate picture of what we actually have on our landscape and, and what types of sites, how large they are. And just a note about the number of sites that we combined, um, 16 sites ended up being 
combined into a parent site on that Mesa top loop and 19 sites on a Cliff Palace loop. Uh, and we would also leave um, the site stakes in place if they were there and mark them on the map and record that. All right, we've been looking at a lot of words. So here are some fun pictures. <laughs> Here's a sample of um, prehistoric artifacts that we found on these surveys. Uh, you can see um, a bunch of pottery on the left. Um, I would say that, yeah, in these surveys, uh, gray wares were the dominant pottery types, uh, a lot of chaping gray and um, mancus corrugated, corrugated ware. Uh, we also uh, found quite a bit of black on white, uh, Chapin black on white, Piedra, Cortez, Mancus black on white, and some red wear. Um, you can see an ax and a projectile point and a core. Oh, and there's a bone bead. We've got, uh, we've got one crew member who's really good at uh, picking out these bone beads, Carol. It's amazing that she can spot them as we're walking over the ground because they're really tiny. As you can see, one of those squares on the, the scale is, is one centimeter, so it's really small. And um, they're often made from stone, sometimes bone. Here's a sample of our historic artifacts. Um, we've got a really cool artifact there on the left that was a, a syrup can that was made into a birdhouse. And uh, we don't know the exact date, but, um, but it was still sitting there in an area where someone had camped and uh, very cool. So we recorded that. Um, you can see a doll leg. Uh, there that's made of bisque. Um, that dates to probably the, the late 1890s or uh, anywhere up to 1930. Uh, but that was that was really neat. Also very small and also found by Carol. <laughs> but uh, yeah, one of, one of the cooler artifacts that we found and we did collect that one. Um, you can also see a, a Prince Albert tobacco tin, plenty of those around. And of course, there's lots of soda and beer bottles out there. Okay, um, here are some of the, a basic summary of our, our results. On the Mesa top loop, um, there were 44 known sites that ended up being updated along this survey. And we found four new sites, including one historic one. Um, we also had isolated finds. These are um, basically a, one or more artifacts uh, that were just deposited in one instance. Um, you know, someone dropped a few cans or, you know, it, it's temporary camp, uh, not worthy of getting a whole site number, but still worthy of being recorded. And uh, three of those were historic. We also had 45 stone headwalls. Headwalls are um, road features uh, to help with drainage along the road. Most of these are put in in the 1930s by the CCC. And, um, and many are still functioning today, but uh, they're also an important road feature that we record and, and uh, monitor and protect during the road work. Uh, the Cliff Palace Loop had 23 known sites updated. We just found one new site along there that was a historic site. And we had six isolated finds, all historic, and 34 stone headwalls there. Okay, this uh, gives you a little bit of information on the types of sites that we recorded and their, their time periods. So the overwhelming majority were habitations. We had 42 habitations. We also had three activity areas. Um, these are areas with no structure, you know, could be a, a temporary um, tool production site or, you know, a campsite if it's a, uh, historic, things like that. Um, middens are artifact concentrations. We had a couple of those and one specialized use site. And I'll talk a little bit about more that one coming up. And uh, as I said, the isolated finds. So if you look at the distribution there, um, many of those sites were uh, in the Pueblo one time period, either combined with basket maker three or Pueblo two, but uh, a total of 35 of our 48 sites have a, a signature somewhere in that Pueblo One time period. Um, that just shows, yeah, we had a strong Pueblo One uh, presence on this part of Chapin Mesa, also Basket Maker Three. Um, 
their Basket Maker 3 and Pueblo 1 communities uh, throughout this part of the Mesa. It's really interesting. Cliff Palace Loop. Uh, we've got 18 habitations, one activity area, five specialized use sites. These were kind of interesting. We don't know exactly what they were used for, but I've got a picture of one coming up and I'll tell you a little, about, little bit about that um, in a few minutes. Uh, so again, um, we had a lot uh, in that, that range, Basket Maker 3 through um, Pueblo 1 and into Pueblo 2. Um, we had a few more Pueblo 2 sites in this survey. But again, we had a total of 14 out of our 24 sites with a, a signature in that Pueblo 1 time period. So this gives you a sample of some of the, the typical sites that we see on our surveys. Uh, I'll talk a, a little bit about each one of these. Um, site 104 that you're seeing there on the left, that's part of our larger Twin Trees community. Um, so it's near one of the stops that you can visit on the Mesa Top Loop. It's a Basket Maker 3 and, and P1 multi-unit habitation site. Uh, it looks like it was occupied all the way from Basket Maker 3 into uh, Pueblo 2 times, but it had quite a few um, Basket Maker 3 rooms. Uh, I think we had, yeah, seven Basket Maker 3 surface rooms. Some of them had burned adobe uh, indicating their location. Um, we did have one Pueblo 1 structure with upright slabs and uh, several rubble mounds and burned rock scatters. And that, is pretty typical of the types of sites found in this area. Uh, site 152 on the top middle, it's a Pueblo 1 habitation, um, a bit of a smaller site, a rubble mound with adobe and uh, uh, another surface rock scatter, and then uh, just a moderate uh, density of, of artifacts there. And that again is pretty typical of what we're seeing out there. This one where you can see uh, Mesa Verde bus in the background, um, that's site 257. It's a large uh, habitation site, multi-unit. Um, Basket Maker 3 in Pueblo 1 again. Um, that one had 18 features, had surface structures indicated by rubble mounds, rubble scatters. It had um, several artifact concentrations and probable pit structure depressions. The pit structures are often filled in and we'll see just a little depression. Sometimes we can't even see them on the surface, but we know about where they should be based on the, the type of site that we're dealing with. Uh, so the, the bottom two are a little more unique. Um, site 52 is um, one of those specialized use sites. These are both specialized use sites. Um, that's a probable Pueblo 3 room block, and you can see uh, the corner of a room here. The rock alignments are still in place there. Um, it could be ceremonial. It could have something to do with agriculture. We're not really sure. There were excavations done there, but they couldn't come to any definitive conclusions either. But an interesting site. Uh, the last one here is site 272. It's a Pueblo 2 to Pueblo 3. Um, specialized use site. And um, that's just our, our name for those sites that uh, seem to have a different function rather than just a habitation or something more conventional. Um, it, it's a dry laid structure, no, no mortar in the, no evidence of mortar uh, when they stack the rocks. Uh, the function's unknown. It was circular or U-shaped. And I think we had about five of these on the survey. They all looked really similar and they could be shrines, you know, some type of uh, ceremonial function, or they could be hunting blinds, we really don't know. Here's a sample of the historic sites that we found. Um, we had, uh, well, I think um, this one on the left, 4422, that's on our Cliff Palace loop. Um, that one is, Oh, probably um, from the 1930s, and it's like a temporary campsite. Uh, let's see. 
It, uh, it had three different trash disposal areas and an activity area. Um, it was located along an old road and there was evidence um, of these camping functions, a wood burning camp stove you can see here, lots and lots of cans and bottles. And then um, here included this picture of a shovel handle just because it, it had a, it was pretty cool with this name inscribed on it, Oliver Ames too. Uh, so that's um, a typical site from the 1930s. And we had you know quite a few of these in the park. Uh, this one on the right, that one is uh, a multi-component site. It had both historic and prehistoric components. And um, the historical component looks like it was related to early tourism in the park. Um, people used to camp in random locations since uh, we didn't have an established campground back in the early days of the park. Uh, so a lot of the, the artifacts um, seem to date from the late 1890s through 1920, but there are artifacts on that site dating all the way up to the present and you know quite a few from the 1960s as well. Um, you can see an old Pepsi bottle here and, um, and a bunch of old cans. And here are some samples of the features uh, where you get a little closer view at some of the, the rock features that we had there. Um, let's see, we've got uh, an upright slab alignment here in the upper left. There's a, a row of upright slabs that's part of a, a Pueblo One room. Um, and this is the, makes up the base of, of the room. And that's uh, Kind of all that's left, but we still have really good alignments and we could make out, you know, the size of the room block. Uh, you can see a few different rock piles, stacked rock uh, in the upper right there. We've got uh, another one of these specialized use sites. Okay. And um, so, oh, hold on. I didn't know that was the right slide, just double checking. All right, um, so after the survey, we made site management recommendations uh, to uh, prepare for the upcoming road work. Uh, we had 24 sites on the Mesa Top Loop that would be potentially disturbed by that work. Uh, so we definitely wanted to monitor those. And 15 of those sites had features in the area of potential effect, which is 20 feet on either side of the road. We did recommend that they realign the road in six different locations uh, because the, we had significant cultural resources right there and we needed to avoid them. Um, and there were eight sites that we recommended for auger testing. On the Cliff Palace Loop, we had nine sites truncated by the road, uh, 12 with features in the APE there, and four sites recommended for auger testing. Here's a visual on, on these rock features that were cut by the road back when the road was initially put in. Um, you can see rocks eroding out of the cut bank. Um, this one in the upper right, it's hard to see at this scale, but there's a, a series of upright slabs. That's another Pueblo One upright slab room block. Um, here too, on the bottom left, you can see a rubble mound uh, with stone eroding out just right on the edge of the road. And here's another one here. So we developed a testing plan. Um, this was for the 12 sites that were recommended for auger testing. Um, and we stuck with uh, sites that were, or we confined our area of auger testing to the limits of disturbance. So we had, construction drawings that we could look at and see just how far out they're going to go. Some, sometimes they're cutting, sometimes they're filling, um, they're doing different things depending on what needs to be done to the road in that location. And, and that helped determine what our process was going to be. But the overall plan was number one, to do a surface artifact collection within those limits of disturbance. And then um, to do the, the bucket auger testing using a three inch auger, uh, testing those um, every two meters in a grid pattern within the site boundaries, within the limits of disturbance. And then based on 
what happened uh, during the auger testing, we would figure out which sites needed to go further. Number three is controlled excavations. So where we had indications of um, cultural materials being buried, then uh, we would need to do further testing. So uh, our auger testing commenced in 2019 and uh, finished up in 2020. Our stabilization crew did a, a bulk of that work. So kudos to them. They worked really hard. This ground is hard to dig and, um, and it was hot. <laughs> I think they started in the fall, um, but yeah, it, it's hard digging in the summer for sure once the, the ground dries out. Uh, but auger testing is great. It's an effective and low cost method to investigate these sites where we're not seeing a lot on the feature uh, of features on the surface, but we know that they're probably there buried. And you can see some charcoal in the, uh, the soil that came out of one of those auger tests there in the bottom right. So just a summary of our auger testing. Um, we try to go down about one meter uh, that wasn't always possible. Sometimes we hit sterile soil before that uh, or, um, got through the cultural material higher up, hit bedrock, whatever. Uh, but we would document all of those tests on a log and record the, the location, the depth of the stratigraphic changes. You know, each horizon that we hit would be recorded and how deep it was as well as the total depth of the test and the moisture depth. And um, it's kind of hard to see on the map, but all those little dots uh, here in a two meter grid pattern along the road, those are the auger tests uh, that were put in on this particular site. So at the end of that, we had three different sites that uh, appeared to have buried cultural remains within the APE. And these were sites 90, 187, and 239. And site 239, um, when we talked to the construction folks about what they were going to be doing there, um, it was determined that we didn't have to do any further testing there. So that means that we had two sites that we had needed to do further excavations at. And this uh, happened in 2020 and 2021. So 5MV-187 was a Pueblo One habitation. Uh, there was just a kind of a sparse scatter of artifacts, ceramics and lithics, and then two small features um, that were indicated by these upright sandstone slabs. We ended up doing 15 auger tests there and two of these are positive. And so those are the locations that determine where we're gonna put in our test units. Uh, site 90 is, um, Basket Maker 3, Pueblo 1, it, um, well, we knew it had at least one surface structure because we could see the upright slabs, but we suspected there were more buried. Um, it had a mid-in, that's that refuse area where uh, the occupants were dumping their trash, usually to the south of the structures. Uh, there were several possible pit house depressions and burned rock concentrations. And the, the testing, uh, which I'll be talking about here coming up, um, revealed that there was also a Pueblo II component to this site um, that we didn't really see with surface artifacts. So that site had uh, a much more of the site boundary was in the limits of disturbance. So this one had 59 auger tests and five of those were positive. So now I'm gonna talk a little, about, a little bit about site 187. Um, this is one that I got to dig on. I was digging out there for a couple of months over the summer. Very hot, very hard ground, but it was really fun to excavate. We don't have a lot of chances to excavate in the park uh, these days. Um, I've been there for over 20 years, and this was only the second time that I've gotten to excavate in the park. So that was exciting for me. Uh, we put in three one by one meter test units. Um, these were called exploratory test units, so EXP, 2, 3, and 4, and those are indicated by the, the blue squares on the map there, and this is, the red is the site boundary, so you can see is a pretty large site, but there's only a little bit of it that overlaps these limits of disturbance, and that's indicated by the dashed line there, um, and it was, it went out a little further, and we had 
just the the one that's um, here to the right wasn't exactly in the limits of disturbance, but that's where one of those upright slabs were, and we didn't know which direction the structure was going, and it very well could have been going over toward the road and under the road. So that's why we excavated there. So this shows what some of the excavated units looked like. Um, they had quite a bit of, well, not a lot, maybe a, a moderate density of artifacts in the upper levels. And then it really thinned out as we dug down, but there was charcoal, there were oxidized um, and also unburned sandstone rocks that we found, all different shapes and sizes there. I mean, you can see that in the picture. That's, it's not like a regular shaped block that you see in a lot of the, the standing masonry that you visit in the park today. Um, this is an early site and those rocks tend to be unshaped. Um, we had ceramics and lithics. Uh, the, the top of these units was really hard, especially the one closest to the road. It had uh, probably 20 centimeters of gravel at the top in you know, asphalt. So it was kind of hard chunking through that, but we made it. Um, oh, the last thing I want to say there is uh, it looked like where these rocks are that we had a prehistoric use surface there. And that's about 30 centimeters below the ground surface. We couldn't really define exactly what we were looking at there, and we would have had to open up more ground, but it was enough to show that we did not have um, a structure going underneath the road. But it looked like we had part of a shallow pit room here. Okay, uh, the, the other excavation unit we did here, number four, this was uh, in the location where we had some upright slabs. Um, you can see them here and in the bottom picture uh, standing up. They were vertical uprights and indicated uh, a probable room. It does appear that the room is going uh, away from the road. So that was good in terms of uh, disturbance from the road work. It looked like it would not be disturbed. But yeah, we dug down um, until we found uh, what looked like a a use compacted floor. Uh, we determined that we were most likely in a pit room. Um, again, hard to say with 100% certainty without opening up more excavation units, but that wasn't necessary. We found out what, what we needed to know. And it looked like these slabs are um, remnants of the, the basal wall construction and that the uh, feature was either circular or subcircular, and it would have been around two meters in diameter or, or a little smaller than that. Um, you can see some of the profile here, this picture in the lower left. Um, this uh, um, thing, uh, the artifact that I'm pointing to, sorry, is uh, part of a bowl, um, a grayware bowl. And that was that was really neat. It was mixed in with all the rocks. Um, we had quite a few nice artifacts in there. All right, the next site. Uh, this one was really interesting because uh, we put in four test units to start with, and one of these revealed evidence of a pit structure um, that you know we suspected there was something deep here based on the auger test, but really there were no surface indications. Um, so this was really interesting. We ended up having an early Pueblo II pit structure here. Uh, this is what the arrow is pointing to. So kind of right in the middle of where this site um, meets the road within the limits of disturbance. Uh, after we dug that, and I'll show you some pictures of that in the next few slides, but um, after digging those test units, we put in five more exploratory test units, um, both to the north and south of there, to try to find additional features associated with that pit structure uh, that would be affected by the road work. And luckily, in terms of the road work, uh, we didn't find much else. We found one possible wall remnant up to the north. So this was really deep. It was over two meters deep to get uh, from the modern ground surface down to the, uh, the floor surface of this pit structure. Um, what we found um, by analyzing things and, um, and trying to figure out uh, the date, we get a temporal date based on um, 
the, the type of structure we're dealing with, the kind of features that it has, the form, and also looking at the pottery, and we can cross-date that pottery uh, if we find it uh, in, in context like associated with the floor. And so that we came up with a date of 930 to 1050 for that early Pueblo II. It appears to be uh, just one occupation. Uh, sometimes these pit houses are occupied more than once and have multiple floors, but we just found one floor. Uh, it was unburned, the roof had been dismantled, so we weren't finding any roof fill in the, in the fill. Um, we were able to estimate what the size of the pit structure could be based on the curvature. You can see a little bit of the, the bench here. It appeared to have an earth bench or banquette, and that curves around and looked like it would have been about 3.7 meters in diameter, which is pretty typical for those structures of that time period. Um, basically in the 10th century AD, uh, what we know about them, it looked fairly typical. And we didn't find any post holes in, in the part that we dug, but we only dug a, a one by two meter unit here. Uh, it did appear to have a prepared surface that was uh, most likely puddled adobe. And, um, and we had some charcoal and other things down here. We'll get a better look at some features on the next slide. Okay, we did have an Ashfield feature that was most likely a hearth that's up here. And you can see a really thick layer of ash and charcoal there. And it was hard to tell from the angle of this photo. Uh, we were working in a confined space, so um, it was challenging to get good photos, but this it is a nice photo showing um, all that thick ash in there. Uh, we also had a probable vent tunnel down here in the lower right. Um, that was in the south wall, uh, but no deflector in front of it. We also found uh, several artifacts on or just above the floor that included a large matate that you can see here, a large Dolores corrugated jar rim shirt, which is here in this middle picture on the bottom, and then uh, several other smaller corrugated shirts. We also had some black and white shirts on the surface, but we did not find black on white uh, down in the pit structure. Okay. Here is um, a sample of some of our, our scaled maps. Uh, we have a really nice uh, plan view where you can see uh, it started out as a one, one, one by one, and then it was expanded as it was clear it was going to go down deeper and deeper, and we needed more room to work. And you saw from the pictures it needed to be shored up too because it did go so deep. Um, there you go. And then uh, here we always draw a profile or an elevation view of, of the walls and, um, and categorize, categorize the different stratigraphic levels that we're seeing and describe those really well, get Munsell um, color, uh, identififications and uh, describe all the different inclusions that we can see. So these are the maps that were produced from there or a sample of them. And that's it for the excavation part. And I just wanna say um, this really is not over yet. We're still um, monitoring this year because they, they're they uh, looking to complete the Cliff Palace loop and start on the Mesa top loop probably in June. Um, so just a heads up that the Mesa Top Loop will be closed this summer, if you hadn't heard that. Um, but yeah, we need to monitor um, any ground disturbance on these sites, uh, including vegetation removal, because the roots go deep, and when they're pulling these out, they're potentially disturbing cultural resources. Uh, here's some pictures from the vegetation removal that was done on Site 90, where that pit house is that you just viewed. Um, it really changes the landscape and, and um, luckily we didn't find uh, too much in the way of, of this, but uh, the road was shifting over here. This is why it's quite a bit wider. I don't know if I mentioned earlier, the bike lane is going to be four feet on either side of the road. So um, in this area, we had to avoid a significant site on the east side of the road and the road was realigned to the west and that's why this goes out uh, quite a bit more. It's more like 10 feet. Okay, 
that is all I have on this presentation. I just really want to say thanks to the crew. A lot of people were involved with the surveys, the auger testing, the excavation, and everybody did a great job in sometimes really challenging conditions. Like I said, it was hot, the dirt was hard, but uh, we learned a lot and we had a lot of fun. So thank you. Well, thank you, Christine. Yes. <laughs> um, um, that was just so informative. It's just an appreciation I have because personally, I didn't know the extent of just the pre-planning phase and the logistics that go into involved to creating the road and then the bike path and so forth. And it's just not as simple as, okay, we'll just put the road like this and go around that site. So thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> and we actually, while you were speaking, there was a, a bunch of questions already in the chat box. So um, I'll leave my questions till the end and let me get straight to them. Um, one moment. Sure. All right. We have a question from SJ. What percentage of the park has sites that have been mapped and are in the database? Um, we do have a pretty good survey coverage in general, but a lot of it is outdated at this point. Um, so for sites that have modern site documentation and that are in our database, um, I would say it's, it's maybe about 60%. Um, a lot of areas are remote and hard to get to, and if they haven't burned, we in the, and they are remote, we haven't been to a lot of those sites, but the sites that are burned, we have really good coverage because we got um, funding to do post-fire assessment. And then we had crews out there on the landscape trying to uh, update all that recording and also assess fire effects and, and do some treatments while they're out there. Sure, well, thank you. Uh, this question's from Jan Wright. Were these ruins road sites excavated at all? or was most of your work observation from the surface? Um, on our survey, it was all observations from the surface. There were a handful of sites that had been previously excavated in the 1950s, or I think one was excavated in the 70s. Um, so we had a couple that we had some excavation data, but they had been backfilled. So we weren't really looking at anything that was exposed any longer. Mm -hmm. This question is from John Slevin. Uh, zero Pueblo three sites on Cliff Palace Loop. Were they all in the alcoves or dot, dot, dot? <laughs> <laughs> uh, most of the Pueblo three sites in that area are um, in, in the alcoves. Uh, we do have a few Pueblo three Mesa top sites, um, but they were definitely starting to migrate down. And then part of Part of the reason we didn't see any is just because we had that narrow linear survey. We were confined to the, the right of way. Uh, whereas if we did a big block survey, we probably would have encountered a few more Pueblo three sites. Mm -hmm. that, that's an interesting question. Um, this question is from Teresa Goldstrand. Please describe auger testing, how it's done, what it is, what it's for. Okay, well, on Archaeological sites, um, we use it to get a window into what is buried beneath the surface without opening up a lot of room. It kind of minimizes the disturbance to the site because obviously when you open up larger excavation units, you're having to remove vegetation and, and you're really disturbing the site quite a bit. But this, this in this case, um, so we use auger probes, um, the, these were three inch, as I said, and um, we just take them out and we had a grid set up and then we would um, we put the auger um, apparatus down in the ground and you, you twist and you it it turns and it pulls out, um, you know, uh, it depends on how far you go down, but you, you fill your bucket and then you can pull it up and you can see the soil that is coming out. Um, and you can see, you know, whether you're in the um, the A horizon. We have all these different uh, soil horizons that we go through, and we keep digging until we know we're beyond anything cultural. 
And as you pull these out, you can empty the soil out and, um, and look for artifacts in it. And then you pull your next bucket out and you have to do quite a few to get down as far as deep as we were going, but it really lets us get a window into the soil stratigraphy, whether there's charcoal, whether there's artifacts, other cultural material. And then we, like I said, keep a log of all that. And that tells us where it looks like we have uh, buried remains. And then we can investigate further to see what they are. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. That was very detailed. Um, and um, going off of um, buried remains, uh, Teresa Goldstrand has another question. Has there been any burials or funerary evidence discovered? I'm assuming in relation to um, the road survey. Right, um, no, not on the, the surface here. Um, we do sometimes find human remains on the surface in other contexts, like uh, after the fire is burned through, sometimes uh, a burial might be exposed. Uh, we did not find any on these surveys. There's definitely potential that, that we'll find some uh, when the road work itself takes place on the Mesa Top Loop. We hadn't found any on Cliff Palace Loop so far when we've been monitoring, but we have a whole plan in place. Uh, if we have what we call an inadvertent discovery and uh, basically all the, the work stops right there until we can investigate and figure out what we're dealing with and you know, tribes are notified and there's a whole process that we go through. Sure. Um, yeah, it, it is a process and understandably. <laughs> um, the next question is from Tammy Jocelyn. What happens to those test sites? Do they get closed back up? That's right. Um, the, the tests that we've done so far are all backfilled. Um, you know, after we've got all of our documentation and photographs, then we do uh, backfill them. And uh, eventually the vegetation grows back and you can't even tell we're there. <laughs> we do have an indication, like you can throw a coin with the year. We try to put that or some flagging tape at the bottom with the year so that just in case uh, someone does dig there again, um, I mean, first they would be able to tell it was disturbed because obviously we can't, and we would put the same dirt that we pulled out, put it back in the hole, um, but it doesn't always look the same. Uh, so someone, if they're re-excavating can tell someone was there, but at least the uh, at the bottom, they can tell what year somebody was there. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's really cool, Christine. <laughs> uh, question from Kay. What was the artifact collection strategy during survey? Did you find any unique diagnostics? Uh, we did find some fairly unique diagnostic artifacts. Um, in this case, we leave everything in place. Um, well, we did to collect that historic doll leg. We, we collect something if it's really unique, um, but yeah, the, the strategy was to do 100% uh, documentation um, if the site was small enough. And then at time, if we had more than um, 200 artifacts on the site, we would pick some sample locations. So we'd usually pick an area um, in the midden where there's dense artifacts or just south of a structure, sometimes in a structure. Um, we would use a, a visual survey to see where it made the most sense to do our artifact uh, either we do a quadrant, like usually two by two meters, um, or what we call a dog leash coming out from a central point for two meters. And then we record everything in that area. And so um, some of the larger sites, we'd have four or five different artifact sample areas. Um, and then on the smaller sites, like I said, we just record everything. Um, but yeah, we found all sorts of different artifacts from uh, flake tools and projectile points to ground stone, monos, and every once in a while you find part of a matate, but monos were more common. Um, and those are uh, hand grinding tools um, in case people aren't familiar with that terminology. Uh, but yeah, and then lots of ceramics for sure. Yeah, I, I always get excited whenever I see black on white. It's just... <laughs> Always one of my favorites. Uh, this question is from Chris Barnes. You backfilled after the ex excavations and then after recording the artifacts, were those beyond the LOD collected or left somewhere on site? Were the sites that were only sampled 
were the post recording artifacts treated differently? You want me to read that again? I, th I think I got it for the most part. Um, let me just read that last sentence again, please. Sure. Were the sites that were only sampled, were the post recording artifacts treated differently? Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, in terms of the, the excavated sites, um, everything that we excavated, we brought back to our lab for analysis. And um, we've done a preliminary analysis, but we haven't done the more detailed analysis yet. And we also took a lot of um, soil samples, pollen samples, that type of thing from our excavations, especially from the structures. And those have yet to be analyzed, but we intend to do that and there'll be a final report. Um, in terms of the artifacts we recorded on survey, um, they're just left in place. Uh, the only ones we collected were the ones within the limits of disturbance that would have been, you know, uh, just scraped away by the heavy machinery. So anything that was going to be destroyed, we collected. Anything that would not have been touched by the roadwork was left in place. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from Teresa Goldstrand. The road widening is for bike lanes, not just accommodating more cars. For the most part, like I said, the road will be uh, widened a bit anyway, uh, going from nine feet in width to 10 and a half feet. And that's mainly because we have so many RVs and uh, buses, large vehicles that come into the park. And when the road was designed back in the 1930s, obviously vehicles were much smaller. And so it was, you know, it was obvious that we just need a little more room, especially, you know, when you watch some of the RVs try to make some of the turns or uh, where the two ways turns to one way, sometimes it's a, a little tricky. Um, so this will make it safer in general. And, um, and then the bike lane, of course, will make it much safer for bicyclists. Okay, and speaking of roads and paving, this is from Nancy Nyberg. Will the new pavement continue to be asphalt? Yes, yes it is. Okay, and we're getting so many lovely feedbacks <laughs> for you, Christine. Excellent presentation. Um, very detailed work and presentation. So lovely. Thank you. Because Christine, you put a lot of energy into this, the preparation. What I loved was seeing the total number of sites um, distributed, how you broke that down for us um, on your chart. That was really interesting to see. So I appreciated that. Also, what kind of road work is gonna happen at the park this summer? Uh, basically, it's the, the repaving of the, the Mesa Top Loop. So um, the good news is that Cliff Palace, when that is finished up here in a, a couple of months, um, that will reopen, uh, we think by mid-June. And then, um, and then the Mesa Top Loop will be closed. So they'll be repaving that whole thing, redoing the parking areas and pullouts, all of that. Um, and that'll be it for road work. Well, actually, that's not quite it. I think they're going to do the roundabout at the base of the, of the hill um, where you enter the park and the turnoff mm -hmm. to the center is. Um, that'll be done this summer as well. And there should be a little bit of road work on the big hill is what we call it when uh, within that first uh, two miles as you're coming up, uh, they need to do some work there as well. And I think that's the extent of it for this year. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. I actually, if, if you don't mind, I would just like to encourage people um, while there will be road construction on the loops, whether on Mesa is open and um, some of the tours that are being offered there are not normally offered. So now is a great time to take advantage of those tours um, and you can reserve your spot on those tours at recreation.gov um, two weeks in advance. They're a little bit like concert tickets because everyone wants to experience these uh, kind of limited opportunities, but please don't stay away from the park just because there's a little bit of road construction. Um, the staff has worked really hard to ensure that your experience is gonna be phenomenal regardless. So that's just my two cents. Um, I hope that that it will, mean that you get to get out and experience a part of the park that you normally wouldn't. Oh, absolutely, Shannon. I totally agree with that. Weatherall Mesa is awesome. It's one of my favorite parts of the park. Uh, it's just beautiful out there. And, you know, you see a lot of wildlife. Generally, it's not 
generally as visited as Chapin Mesa, um, and it just has a special feel to it. And then also, yeah, there's our Farview sites and our stabilization crew is going to be doing um, some work in that area again this summer at Farview and at uh, Coyote Village, I think. Um, so anyway, there'll there'll be some neat preservation work happening and there's a lot of cool sites to see up in that area as well. Well, wonderful. Um, I think that kind of concludes. We just have a lot of wonderful feedback. Um, oh, quickly before we go, um, Nancy Nyberg would like to know, does this include Mug House? Um, yes, there will be tours to Mug House this summer. Oh, wonderful. That's great. So Nancy, you can go to Mug House. <laughs> yeah, right. All right. Well, thank you so much. That concludes uh, today's presentation. And Christine, thank you. And hopefully we'll be able to have you back for a third time. That would be wonderful. All right. You're welcome. And thank you. Thank All you, right. Christine. Thank you, Monica. And thanks to everyone for joining us today.